Hello everyone, my name is Benoît Goussen from eBacon in Germany and I would like to introduce you to this project on the development of a DEB egg laying module for birds exposed to pesticides. This project is conducted by a consortium composed of Starlight Augustine, Marcus Ebeling, David Ekman, Lina Lika, Lina Marne and André Gex. As we all know, Environmental risk assessment of chemicals such as plant protection products, for example, relies on laboratory experiments. We also know, however, that the exposure pattern used in these experiments is far from the one observed in the natural environment. For birds, environmental risk assessment of commercially available pesticide is currently based on the statistical analysis of data collected from standard OECD 206 bird reproduction experiments. These studies report the feeding, growth, and reproduction, as well as the observed F1 hatchling size and subsequent growth. The exposure induced laboratory studies is usually a constant concentration applied over 20 weeks. This scenario does not match the realistic exposure scenario observed in the field, leading to differences in the expected effect over time between the two exposure situations. This di discrepancy impact the capacity to assess the risk of real-life application of pesticide to real-world birds populations and limits the applicability of statistical method to perform scenarios analysis and optimize application rates. It is also important to note that the reproduction of birds, and here especially the bobo-white quail used in the OECD experiment, is different in the laboratory and in the wild. We are here presenting some of the key information and some differences that need to be accounted for when using uh, DEB modeling for risk assessment purposes. In the wild, the egg preparation and egg laying occurs as batches of about 12 eggs at a rate that is slightly lower than one egg per day. In OECD experiment, however, the eggs are removed as they are laid. This induces a continuous egg laying until the end of the experiment. The rate of egg laying, however, is a little bit slower, around 0.5 to 0.7 eggs per day. In both cases, the initiation of reproduction is dependent on abiotic factors, such as the daytime length, for instance. And several weeks are needed to prepare the reproduction system before the first eggs are laid. In the OECD experiment, this initiation of the reproduction is triggered by an increase of the number of hours of light per day. Finally, it was also observed that females increase their food consumption during the breeding period, especially in the OECD experiment. As we saw in the previous slide, bobwhite quail nest in spring and only produces clutches of 10 to 15 eggs. On the other hand, quail under OECD experimental conditions will continuously lay eggs. This takes a physiological toll on the birds. At the start of our investigation, we noticed that females increase feeding drastically with respect to males. After looking at various possible alternatives to explain how this extra food consumption was utilized, we found that the following hypothesis best applies. The extra assimilates compensate for an increase in somatic maintenance reflected by the physiological toll that continuous uh, egg production incurs. We represented this by correlating the feeding to the maintenance rate together using the following equations, where um, ST is a monotonic increase function. These changes are starting at the induction of the reproduction and uh, during the egg laying. New assumptions were also posed regarding the egg laying module itself. We assume that the allocation to reproduction starts at the maturity threshold for puberty, but that the energy is first accumulated in a reproduction buffer. The start of egg production itself is triggered by abiotic factors and follows the following rules. The first one is that the egg size is variable over time and calculated assuming the maternal effects. This means that the reserve density at birth equals the reserve density of the mother at egg formation. Indeed, the feeding data and the observation of weight at birth of the new generations 
showed viability. And we know that variable feeding implies non-constant reserve density of the mother and consequently non-constant reserve density at birth. The second rule is that an egg is released provided that there is sufficient energy available in the reproduction buffer. And finally, the time between egg laying is constant and estimated from the data. Concretely, the buildup of the reproduction buffer during an OECD reproduction experiment is expected to follow the following pattern. The experiment will usually start with immature adults. These are organisms that have passed the maturity threshold, but with a regressed reproductive system. This individual will be acclimated during a couple of days and then exposed to a compound via the food for several weeks. Photostimulation will then trigger the maturation of the reproduction system, and after about 40 days, the egg laying will begin. During all this period, the reproduction buffer is building up. Then, at the initiation of the egg laying, it starts to be depleted at each egg laying event until the food depletion. We tested this physiological module against an OECD 206 reproduction experiment performed with a bob white quail. As explained in the previous slide, this experiment started with young adults and lasted 20 weeks. In the first 10 weeks, the bird was kept immature, then the gonad maturation and reproduction was induced. The exposure to fungicide was done via treated food, and one male and one female were sharing a cage and a feeder. Different measurements were performed along the experiment. In particular, the body weight was measured at the beginning, initiation of long day, and at the end of the experiment. The food consumption were, was measured uh, weekly per cage, for, so for each pair. Um, the eggs were collected daily and set in a breeder in a weekly lot. The egg viability and embryo survival was monitored by candling, and the number of hatchling and the weight of the hatchling at hatch and after 14 days spot hatch on a untreated diet was also monitored. So we first decided to test the physiological module against control data and put it into context by using also literature data. The first step in our approach was to compile a large amount of literature data concerning the species life history as well as control data from one of the OECD experiments. We show here to the left uh, growth in weight weight as a function of time. The symbols are the data and the line the model prediction. The red symbol and line are data and model prediction from a 1978 study by Jones and Hugg. In the second part, we have a blue and red line from the OECD data, OECD control data. The right plot here shows the predicted mean mass of the eggs as a function of the experimental week, and we here assume the maternal effect rule. As we can see, both the growth and egg mass pattern of the control organism are well predicted by the, by the physiological module. We we'll highlight here that um, in between the dot is a predicted offloading of eggs um, in red for females and in blue for males. Um, according to the physiological based reproduction buffer handling rules. Each day an egg can be laid if there is enough energy in the reproduction buffer for that egg. We also compared some implied properties of our physiological module to the literature data. In particular, we used data from peak and collaborators that measures the oxygen consumption between breeding and non-breeding individuals for a closely related species. As we can see here, the um, observed oxygen consumption increase is very well captured by the model as well. So as we were satisfied with our physiological module, we implemented an ecotoxicological module. We assume that the uptake of compound is proportional to the food level and that the concentration in the food is constant in each treatment. We used a simple one compartment kinetic, assuming that all of the compound was stored in the structure. The toxicokinetic is then governed by the dominant rate constant and the damage dynamic.
The effect itself is governed by the threshold for effect or no effect concentration and by the tolerance concentration. The effect starts to show up when the damage level crosses the no effect concentration. The effect then increases linearly with an intensity controlled by the tolerance concentration. The type of effect is induced by the type of depth parameters impacted. The usual physiological mode of actions were implemented, in particular an effect on the assimilation of energy from food, an increase of the somatic and maturity maintenance, an increase of the cost to produce a new unit of structure, or an increase of the cost to produce an egg. After a different simulation, the fungicide seems to target the cost for making an egg in females. This makes both the reproductive output decrease as well as the final weight, as we can see on these plots. The left one here presents the cumulative reproduction as a function of time since birth, and the right one the weight weight of female as a function of time since birth. The red data and model lines are the control data, then going into increasing concentration level. As we can see on these graphs, the level of effect on the reproduction is well predicted, with however a slight delay um, in the onset of the effect. An effect on growth is also predicted, which is not fully on par with the data. This can be explained by um, discrepancy in the feeding data. So in conclusion, this project allowed us to take the first steps toward the standard development and use of a DEM model for analyzing standard OECD bird reproduction data used in environmental risk assessment of plant protection product. We saw that the standard uh, model captures the whole life cycle of the quail very well. In this model, we assume that the early juvenile eat at a higher food level or um, food with higher nutrition content than the later juvenile and adults. And this period of higher feeding strongly impacts the growth of um, the juvenile during the first few weeks of life. The upregulation of feeding during the egg laying period is here interpreted as a response to stress as model as an increase in somatic maintenance. This model assumption is supported by literature respiration data. We kept um, the assumed food level constant for the OECD treatment, but the data suggests um, higher food intake in the higher treatment, which might explain the mismatch uh, in the final weights. And finally, um, it is very important to capture the advent of puberty very accurately, because individuals start allocating to reproduction at puberty, whereas the exposure to toxicants start after puberty and before egg laying. In this context, the physiological mode of action on reproduction efficiency only starts to impact the model output once the egg laying is initiated. So thank you everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I would like to thank again my colleagues from the consortium and Bayer for sponsoring this project. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me or one of my colleagues.